Hi, this is Jason Rohr, and this is the first tutorial video for the controller interface of Sleep is Death. If you want to get into the controller interface without waiting for a player to connect, for example, if you want to create some scenery ahead of time before telling a player a story, or you just want to practice with the interface without any time pressure, how do you do that? Um, after you get past the title screen and the volume adjust screen, you're on this menu here that you can pick an option with the keyboard. Go ahead and pick an, the top option, host a local network game as controller, and then, as it says here on the screen, press the G key to start playing without a connection. So that dumps you right into the controller interface without waiting for a player to connect and allows you to start using it. So the most basic thing about this interface are the tooltips. Up here at the top of the screen, tooltips are displayed for every single component, every single control, every single object in the scene or in the database. So if you're wondering what something is or what something does, put your mouse over it and take a look at the tooltips. What does this interface do? This interface allows us to specify background scenery and objects within that scenery for the player to interact with. There's always at least one object in every single scene. That is the player object. That object can never be deleted. Here we have some default background scenery um, and a default object for the player, which is an, sort of an invisible object. We need to assign the player an object um, in the world so that they can see where they are. We could have an invisible player in certain story settings. Um, but let's go ahead and, and pick an object for the player here. Up here and at the top of the right sidebar is the object picker. It's a searchable database of all the objects that have been created so far in the game. Let's search for farmer and click on the farmer here to set the player as the farmer. We have the move tool selected down here. So that means that when we click on the grid, we can move the player around um, to wherever we click. So now we have the player set up. Let's create some more objects for the player to interact with. How about the farmer's wife, April? Wife and daughter, in fact, are both named April in the database. Um, so let's drag her out uh, of the database and drop her into the scene in a spot. And let's pick April as well. And let's add one more object for the uh, farmer to interact with. Let's add the dog. Got to spell it right here, dog. OK, uh, there's the dog. Put the dog down here in the scene. Let's move April. So now that we have objects in the scene, by clicking on any of them, uh, we select it, and then we can move it around as well. OK, so this is a black box theater type of setup. No background scenery, three uh, characters for the, farmer, for the player who's playing the farmer to interact with. And you could play out a complete story uh, just in this very basic mode of operation. So what could we do um, besides positioning the objects around? We can also make them talk. By clicking on an object, like let's click on little April here, and just typing, we can have her say something. Hi, Father. OK, now let's click on the dog and make him say something. OK, so notice that the dog's speech bubble is positioned in kind of a weird spot here. Speech bubbles default to being anchored to the center of their object. Um, but that's not so good for the dog whose mouth is off to the side. So then we can use the speech tool here to reposition the dog's speech bubble into a good spot. And we can also use the flip tool to flip it into a good spot. So let's put the dog's speech bubble in a good spot um, and flip it over to the left like that. Let's try to do the same thing for the mother here because her speech bubble is not going to be a good spot either because she's so tall. Let's move the speech bubble up and put it up here and say... So she's getting hungry. Um, let's not forget to do the same for the player's speech bubble. Uh, we cannot type into the player's speech bubble, but we can still position it in a good spot. And when the player starts typing, that's where their speech will go. So now that we've got all these speech bubbles positioned and with some text in them, notice that they, as we use the move tool again, speech bubbles move and stay connected to the object that they are associated with. And when the speech uh, gets too close to the edge of the screen, it's going to go off the screen. They automatically flip. If they get too close to the top of the screen, the speech bubble's tail automatically moves to try and keep the speech bubble on the screen. So as you get a more complicated scene with more characters talking uh, and you're positioning them in good spots so that their speech is all visible, uh, it pretty much is automatically positioned once you get them set once. OK, so that's the basics of setting up some characters that are talking to the player. Uh, and if the player had a turn now, uh, they would see all this speech and then get to type in their own speech bubble a response and potentially execute some sort of action. So uh, we could carry out a whole story, like I said, just uh, with this very basic setting. Um, let's say we did want to specify some background scenery. How do we do that? We use the room editor here uh, by clicking this button. Uh, here we can use the tiles to actually paint a room, and I'm not going to explain the, the full details of the room editor in this tutorial video. Let's just pick a pre-made room from the room picker down here. So let's search for farm. It's a database of rooms, just like the database of objects we saw before, and click on this uh, farm room here, which has a nice pond in it. Okay, so let's close the room editor, and now that scenery is set. Um, and now these objects, because of the new scenery, are in kind of weird spots. So let's put the farmer in a better spot. Let's get her away from the edge of the pond, put her up here, and put the dog on the path here. Okay, so now we've got our three objects with some background scenery. 
And it's still a little plain though. Let's let's add some more objects to the scene. Let's add some trees to make the the scenery look a little bit uh, more complete. Uh, here's some nice small trees. I'll drag some of them out here. Kind of feel like Bob Ross when I'm when I'm doing this. Uh, okay, so let's put one up here um, and put one right next to the pond with some roots growing into the pond like that, and put another one down here. So now, as you can see, we got all these different anchors here for these objects, and the scene is getting pretty complicated. And that means that we might click on one by accident. We might, you know, have the tree selected to make it talk by accident. Wait, that's not what we wanted to do. Um, the other problem is that if objects are in the same location as other objects, um, they might get drawn on top of, like this dog would be behind the tree here because it was added before the tree into the scene. And now if we try to click, the top object is selected, so it's hard to click the dog, which is the thing that we'd really want moving around. We don't really want the tree moving around. So how do we deal with that? We can lock these objects into the scene uh, as sort of part of the background scenery with this lock button here. So let's go ahead and lock that tree. And now once it's locked, we can't click on it by accident anymore. Um, Let's click on the dog and move him down here. Now the dog is in front of the object because that's a locked object. Um, and we can't, we can't click on it by accident. It's not, we're not going to make it talk by accident. So let's go through and for each of these trees, lock them into the background scenery. Okay. So that simplifies our scene quite a bit for all of the objects that you know, we don't really want to manipulate. We just want them kind of in there. And we want to really focus on when we click and move something, we want it to be one of these prime objects that we're most likely going to be moving around. Okay, so that's how you do that. Now let's say that one of these objects is an object that you actually want um, to manipulate. Let's say the player walks up to this, walks up to this tree and tries to climb it or chop it or something, and then you, you need to manipulate it. Go ahead and uh, unlock all the objects in the scene to, to d disable all the locks. We can, we can toggle locks like this on and off. So unlock the objects and then click on this object and unlock it specifically and then relock the rest. So now this tree is one unlocked object that we can move around. We can even make it talk or whatever we need to do for it. Um, so that's how you lock and unlock objects. That's how you create a more complex scene uh, without being overwhelmed. Um, okay, so that's all the basics of creating scenes, um, setting up things for the player to manipulate and interact with. Now let's say the scene looks good and uh, all the objects are in the right spot and we want to be able to call the scene up later. So we can save it by giving it a name. Let's call it uh, Farm Pond and pressing the Add button to add it to our scene database. So now if we search for pond here, we have our pond scene in the database. Let's search for some other farm scenes just to see how the scene picker works. Um, here's a farmhouse. Here's another scene with a farm pond, a different one. Here's inside the farmhouse. Uh, here's a little orchard. Okay, so let's say we've gone through this and we actually want, so we've, we've done this orchard scene and now we want to do that farm scene, that pond scene again. Let's go ahead and search for pond again. Um, and by um, clicking on the pond, um, we automatically get back to that scene that we had set. And the other thing about this is that there's, Let's say we made a mistake and we want that scene back. Actually, we want that speech back. We didn't. We we loaded these scenes and it cleared out the speech. Uh, let's go back and and uh, get back to the spot where uh, we had that speech that we wanted for the first first scene of the game. So by using the undo button, we can undo back through 256 levels of uh, moves that we've made and different changes that we made. Objects locked and unlocked and moved around. Scene changes, um, different background scenery picked, and so on all the way back to the very beginning, I mean, assuming we haven't made more than 256 moves. Uh, and then we can hit the redo button if we've gone too far. So let's redo back to that good spot with the trees, one tree unlocked. Uh, now those trees are locked. Okay, so there we are, all the trees locked except for one, and we're ready to go for the first scene of the game. Um, the undo button is also mapped to control Z, so if you wanna quickly undo things, just hit control Z. Okay, so now we're ready um, for, the, uh, for the player. Uh, all the objects are in a good spot and so on. The one last thing I'm going to show you uh, is the, um, the one last editor I'm going to show you is the music editor, which you can use the, hit the music button here. This is a simple tone matrix where you can place um, notes on a grid and play around with it. It's very, uh, very self-explanatory. So we've specified some music, we've got um, scenery set up, and now the player could connect to us, but that might be a little nerve wracking, right? We only have 30 seconds to respond to their move and how does that really feel? Uh, if we want to practice ahead of time without a player connecting, we can go ahead and use the practice mode. So by clicking on this little clock here, it starts the timer so we can feel what 30 seconds feels like. Get the scene set up, get it ready to go. And just like as if we had a player connected, we can hit the send button. So this is a total simulation. Once we send and confirm, we're then put into the player side. So we're playing both sides of this interface now. And we can see how the player sees the world here with these very simple buttons just to manipulate their one character. Come over here, make their character talk. And let's actually make the character player is going to kiss his wife.
and move him up here so that he kisses his wife. Okay. Now the player can send the players the false player can send the players move across. Now we get to see what we'd see. Now we have 30 seconds to respond to this. It's a little nerve wracking. Um, okay, so let's get uh, let's say let's have her say have her say ah, and have, let's have the dog say wolf again. Okay, now we can send that move across, and we see what the player would see in that situation. When we're done with the practice mode, all we do is click this button to get back into the controller interface and stop the timer. And now we're, again, ready for a player to connect now that we've practiced a little bit. So those are all of the basics of how to set up scenes, how to put objects in those scenes, how to manipulate, manipulate the speech on those objects, lock them into the background scenery, specify music, and practice. Um, so that should get, be enough to get you started using the pre-made objects and pre-made scenes. Um, later videos are going to show how you can make your own objects and how to make your own scenery. Thank you.